I created seven evolutionary puzzles, seven different scenarios with unintuitive outcomes and mechanics, which will put your knowledge about evolution to test. Each puzzle has a series of questions for you to answer. Get them right, and you'll receive some points. At the end, there will be a leaderboard, where you can compare your score to see how well you did. The puzzles are ranked from easiest to hardest. To solve them, you'll need to understand the basic processes of evolution. Some puzzles will be straightforward, in some you'll have to think outside the box, and in others, I will outright trick you. If you fail, just give it some time and try again. Good luck. This is the setup we'll use. I want you to have some place where you can write your answers down. You can use pen and paper, you can use your phone's notepad, or you can just write them in toothpaste in your bathroom mirror. Just don't do it in the comment section, or you could spoil them for other viewers. Each puzzle will have its own video. We'll start with easier ones. While they're the easiest, they will still have some challenging and unintuitive questions. Thinking each question through will help you build the knowledge and reasoning processes needed to tackle the more difficult ones. If you struggle with a question or don't understand the answer, drop by our Discord server and ask for help. Remember, the ultimate purpose of these puzzles is to learn. Oh, and please don't just keep the answers in your head. It will be a tad too easy to say, oh, I totally thought about that, when you actually didn't. Let's check out the first puzzle. We have two replicators who will bounce around in a hidden secret crypt. This crypt has large windows through which the sunlight gets in. The crypt is bright during the day and very dark at night. Daytime will favor the white replicator Claire, while night will favor the black replicator Nayati. More specifically, each replicator will have a higher chance of replication and a smaller chance of death during their preferred time. We'll keep track of the day-night cycle, and we'll calculate the chances of each replicator to replicate and die with this equation, where L ranges from minus 1 to 1 and indicates the amount of light entering the crypt. If you're not math inclined, this simply means that the replication and death chances will oscillate between 0 and 10% per second. A full day-night cycle will be 60 seconds. For simplicity, these replicators will not mutate. We'll start with 15 replicators of each type and in the middle of the day. With this setup in mind, here are the first two questions. 1. How will the population change during the first few day-night cycles? This refers to both the proportions of each replicator type and also their absolute numbers. And 2. What will happen as time goes on? Let's say as time goes to infinity. Take your time to reason through your solution. Do you think the population will stabilize, maybe at 50% for each replicator? Or will it cycle up and down? Do you think any one replicator will be favored? Do you think either or both of the replicators will go extinct? If you struggle to come up with an answer, I have some videos in my channel covering the basic evolutionary processes, like selection, drift, and mutations. You can give them a watch to freshen up some concepts. Now, pause the video and keep watching once you've written down your answer. If you need a hint, I'll say this. It is helpful to imagine the simulation as a series of steps. Let's say each step is 5 seconds. Try and see if you can model what would happen from one step to the next. And once you can do that, see if you can now extend your model to the rest of the simulation. It will also be helpful to think of the base case, where the day-night cycle doesn't exist, and the chances for replication and death are constant. Think of what would happen in that scenario and whether you can use that information to make a better reasoning about our current case. Now before telling you the solution, let's watch the simulation for a little bit to become more familiar with it. Or skip straight to the answers if you prefer. I would like to use this time to tell you that these simulations are made with my custom software, Ghost's Garden. If you want to be able to create simulations like this on your own, you can get an early access version by supporting me on Patreon. Link is below. Thank you. 
If we look at the results of several simulations, we can get a clearer image of what's happening. We see that during the daytime, Claire's population tends to go up while Niatis goes down. And the reverse is true for nighttime. We can also say that during the day, Claire is favored by selection while Niat is unfavored, and it is the opposite during the night. What's important to realize here is that selection cares about what's effective right now, not in the future. When it is nighttime, the population of Niatis goes up and the population of Claire goes down, even though the daytime is coming and it will make the Claire's thrive. There is no foresight about what will be good in the future. You gain 3 points if you get that each replicator's population would cycle throughout the day, and 2 more points if you got that the cycling was endless. We also see that the population size is uncapped, with some peaks getting extremely high for no apparent reason. In fact, because the replication and death chances don't take into account the current number of replicators, the only real limit that the size of this population has is my GPU catching fire. In other words, instead of stabilizing around a certain number, the size of this population just drifts around chaotically. We can also realize that each subpopulation is completely independent from each other. There aren't any resources that are competing over and I didn't even enable collisions between them. There's no interaction. In fact, we could remove one replicator entirely and the population curve of the other would stay exactly the same. You gain 3 points if you got that the total population size would not stabilize. Finally, we can see that in every single simulation, if given enough time and without exceptions, both replicators eventually became extinct, even if it took over an hour in one case. We can reason this out quite easily. Because the total population size changes randomly, if we give it enough time it will eventually cross zero. And once you get to zero, there's no going back to one. You gain 2 points if you got that both replicators would eventually become extinct. If you didn't get it right, don't get too disheartened. Let's see the reasoning steps we could have followed to reach the correct answer. First, we could have looked at the base case, without a day-night cycle, and with replication and death chances constant at 5%. In this case, we can see that, at any point, the population has an equal chance of going up and down, and there's no mechanism stabilizing the total population. If the day-night cycle is active, then all the replication and death chances will still average out at 5%, even if they oscillate up and down. And since we know that the two subpopulations are independent, then we can reasonably assume that the population size will be unstable. Then we could have looked at the simulation as a series of steps. This way, it's easy to see that in each step, the replicators which have a replication chance higher than their death chance will tend to increase in numbers, while if their death chance is higher than their chance to replicate, then their numbers will tend to dwindle. From this, we can extrapolate that we expect the populations to cycle indefinitely. Now that we know how to solve this scenario, let's make it more complicated. Let's give any new replica a 10% chance of mutating into the other type. For 4 points, what do you think will be different now, and what will be similar or the same? Again, this refers to both relative and absolute numbers, and both short and long-term development of the population. This question is substantially more difficult than the previous one, but let's see if you can use what you learned to make accurate predictions. And for one final point, when do you think there will be more mutations into each replicator? Meaning, do you think mutations from Claire to Niati will be more numerous at a specific time of the day-night cycle? And what about mutations from Niati to Claire? Take your time to think through these answers and use the process I just taught you of first thinking about the base case and then dividing the simulation into steps. Even if the questions seem hard, I believe you can do it. And just so you know, I myself go through these questions too and try to predict what will happen. Just because I programmed the simulations doesn't mean that I know their outcome beforehand. Alright, let's watch and find out the answers.
first sight, these results look quite similar to the ones we got earlier. I would say that the curves look more balanced, meaning we don't get many situations when one curve is much higher than the other. Which makes sense considering that the more numerous replicators will be constantly spawning replicators of the other type. But the general cycling behavior stays the same. We also see that these systems can't ever achieve fixation. As long as one replicator remains, it can always generate more replicators of both types. You gain one point if you predicted that the population would cycle as we saw before, and another point if you predicted either that the curves would now be more balanced, or that fixation in this scenario would be impossible. If we look at the extinction data, then we get some funny results. Yes, some simulations go extinct as luck would have it, but most of them just don't. And notice the upward tendency of these graphs. As in the simulation we watched, the number of creatures start to rise indefinitely, my GPU starts to cry, and the creatures just outright refuse to die, sometimes reaching numbers in the thousands and persisting over hundreds of hours, in a true test of patience and determination. I was very confused by this. True, I expected the system to be more resilient to extinction than the previous one, and for a very simple reason. Since fixation is now impossible, we expect that there will almost always be some replicators alive which benefit from the current light intensity. For the system to go extinct, you would need both subpopulations to diminish at the same time, even though there's always one which has positive odds to rise. But the thing is, the population size as a whole is still unstable. There's no mechanism that brings it closer to a specific value, and so, with time, we would expect it to drift and eventually cross zero, as in the previous scenario. Meaning, even though it would take longer, extinction should still be an inevitable certainty. But it isn't. The argument I made relies on two assumptions. One, the population size is unstable. We've shown this is true. Two, the population's average chance of increasing and decreasing are equal meaning the expected population change over one whole day-night cycle is zero. And since extinction isn't happening, we have to assume that this second one is false. Thankfully, we can just calculate the expected population change straight from the formulas we defined earlier, adding up all new replicas created and subtracting all deaths during some specific time frame t. Notice how, since mutations don't change the population size, we don't need to concern ourselves with them here. But since we know the values for these replication death chances as a function of light intensity, we can replace the values in the equation to get something like this. And now we do some algebra. For a short amount of time t, we can use this formula to predict the average population change, where during the day, meaning when L is positive, delta p will be positive if there are more clairs than naieties, and during the night, when L is negative, delta p will be positive if there are more naieties than clairs. We could divide the simulation in small steps, say of one second, and then say that the population will drift randomly if the sum of this delta p for 60 seconds is zero. It will tend to grow if it's bigger than zero, and it will tend to shrink if it's less than zero. If you're math inclined, you will realize that we can make these intervals infinitely small, and what we actually have is an integral over 60 seconds, meaning a sum of infinitely small intervals of simulation. Although, I'm afraid this is a tad too difficult for me to solve. But we could just compute it during the simulation. For comparison, we'll look at a scenario without mutations on the left and with mutations on the right. The big number you see on the screen is the expected population change of the last frame of the simulation, and the number below is the average value per frame from the beginning of the simulation until now. This is fascinating. On the left, we see that the expected population growth has an average of zero, which will lead to inevitable extinction. But when mutations are on, the same is not true. The expected population growth is positive, meaning the population will tend to increase in size non-stop. So, my prediction was wrong. These populations tend to ever-expanding growth, not extinction. And the key to understand why this happens is the final question I gave you. Let's look at which point within the day-night cycle has the most abundance of each mutation. 
clairs mutating into niatis are most frequent at the very end of the day, when clairs are almost at their peak numbers and their replication chance is still very high. This makes sense, as we should expect mutations to be most abundant when the number of clair replications is the highest, meaning we need both lots of clairs and a high replication chance. And for niatis mutating into clairs, mutations are most frequent at the very end of the night, for the very same reasons we discussed. You gain one point if you predicted that mutations from clair to niati would be most frequent around the end of the day. If you just wrote day in general, then you don't get any points. Let's now use a numerical example to illustrate how mutations could lead this otherwise doomed population to ever-expanding growth. Let's say that we start the daytime with 100 clairs and 100 niatis. Let's say throughout the daytime, the clairs replicate once each and half the niatis die. This is, of course, a simplification, but it will help with illustration. Without mutations, we would now be starting the night with 200 clairs and 50 niatis. However, with a mutation rate of 10% at replication, this number is actually 190 clairs and 60 niatis. If now throughout the night the same thing happens, and each niati replicates once and half the clairs die, here's what would happen. If we didn't have mutations, we would just go back to our initial 100-100 population. With mutations on, however, we reach the end of the night with 114 niatis and 101 clairs, showing that our population has grown. While this numerical example uses made-up numbers, it can give us an intuitive understanding of why the population grows in one case, but not in the other. So, to end this, you gain one point if you predicted the system to be more resilient to extinction than the previous one, and another point if you expected it to have a tendency to grow indefinitely. I got the second one wrong, and so I actually wouldn't be getting a perfect score. So, to recap, what did we learn? First, we saw that selection only cares about right now, not the future, and this can cause cyclical behaviors in a population. We also saw that if the population size is unchecked and it has an equal chance to grow or shrink, it will drift around in a chaotic manner and the population will eventually become extinct. Finally, we saw that just by introducing mutations, at least in a very specific scenario, we could create a tendency towards infinite growth in an otherwise doomed population. Also, we learned a couple of lessons. One, I'm fallible like every other ghost, and I took get my prediction wrong sometimes. And two, precisely because of this, we should not be too enamored of our reasonings and it's always better to check our conclusions with a simulation. You should now have a score out of 15. Keep it somewhere safe and come back when the next puzzle is ready. If you want to create simulations like this on your own, or you simply enjoy this and want to support me, consider joining my Patreon. You'll get access to an alpha version of Ghost's Garden, and I'll be a happy ghost. If you did poorly in the puzzle, don't get discouraged. What's most important is what you learned, and how you can use that knowledge to make more accurate predictions in the future. Until the next one. Take care.